You might be surprised to know that I've known Geoffrey for 77 years. How can that be, you ask? Well, he's my older brother. Uh, although his surname is not the same, he changed his surname many years ago. Although even the 77 years that I say that I've known Geoffrey isn't quite true because of incidents that happened in the Second World War. When uh, France fell to the Germans in May 1940, it looked absolutely inevitable that Germany was about to invade Great Britain. The British government tried to persuade parents to send at least one of their young children overseas to Canada, to South Africa, to New Zealand, and to Australia. There were 220,000 applications that the government received. I was nearly five, Jeff was eight. Fortunately or unfortunately, shipping shortages caused a very long delay in getting people accepted and shipped. And finally and fatally, on 17th of September, a ship was torpedoed with 90 children on board, 13 of whom were rescued and 77 perished. After that sinking, the whole plan was abandoned. And in the end, only about 2,600 children were evacuated successfully. Geoffrey was one of those, and at the age of eight, he sailed from Liverpool to Australia in September 1940, and we did not see him again for six long years. Just as a very brief postscript, there was a, a female escort on board ship looking after Jeff and others, a Mrs. Fox. On the way back from Australia, her ship was sunk, she was picked up, and she spent the rest of the war in the German concentration camp. I'm sure Jeff would be able to share with us lots of interesting experiences about all of that, but he's not here for that purpose. He's here to talk about a scandalous and largely suppressed series of events after the Second World War. Just before inviting Geoffrey to speak, I've been asked to mention that we put one of his books dealing with the Gloucester Meteor on each table. They're available for $20, and Jeff has asked that any proceeds are devoted or given to our Rotary Club. So, ladies and gentlemen, my brother Geoffrey to talk about the Gloucester Meteor. Thank you, Tony. I didn't expect such an emotional introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about the Allies' first and only jet aircraft to be used in the Second World War. The story starts in the 1920s with Frank Whittle in England. In 1923, he wrote a thesis arguing for gas turbines or rockets be needed for high-flying aircraft, and so he is regarded as the father of the aircraft gas turbine production industry. His ideas, of course, were not interesting to the air ministry. Nevertheless, in 1930, he patented a gas turbine design. There he is testing one of his early gas turbines. Five years later, in 1935, the patent lapses because he can't afford the five pound fee. So he goes around the country trying to get people interested 
and in 1936 with investment bankers OT Falcon Partners, Powerjets Limited was formed and they continued developing the gas turbine engine. Finally, in 1938, the Air Ministry did give funds to Whittle's Power Jets Company. And in 1941, the first aircraft powered by a jet engine flies in the UK. The first aircraft. That's a replica. And that's the engine that was used. I'll see if I can use my pointer. That's not too good, I know that diagram. Can you see my pointer? Yeah. You, the inlet is a double-sided centrifugal compressor. The compressed air went through this annulus and reversed into the combustion chamber. And then through the turbine, which drives the compressor, and the excess air exhaust as the jet. Can you hear me when I turn my head? <coughs> so, moving back to the meteor itself. In 1940, George Carter, chief designer of the Gloucester Aircraft Company, presents proposals for a twin-engine jet fighter. In 1941, the Gloucester 39 flies, that one, and in 1943, the first prototype Gloucester Meteor fighter flies. In 1944, the first production Gloucester Meteor F1, powered by Rolls-Royce Derwent engine flies. That's the Gloucester Meteor F1. I just point out a couple of things. It looks pretty good. Just look at the nacelles, inlet nacelles, and the uh, tailplane. We'll see a difference as that develops. Uh, that's the engine. Thing. You'll see on the uh, cross section below the same centrifugal compressor but now exhausting directly into the combustion chambers so a little more compact than previously turbine jet exhaust in 1944 RAF 616 squadron received their first Meteor F1s, which are replaced by F3s within six months. Fourteen kills of flying bomb V1s were claimed that year. Wind tunnel and flight tests demonstrated that the original short nacelles of the F1 contributed heavily to compressibility buffeting at high speed. New longer nacelles in the F3 not only cured some of the compressibility problems, but added 75 mile an hour to its speed and altitude. The first Gloucester Meteor F4 prototype flies in May 1945, later creating the world speed record of 616 miles per hour. It didn't come into production until 1946 after the war, but there was soon 16 RAF squadrons equipped with Meteor 4s. The Meteor 4 was used for converting pilots from propeller engines to jet aircraft. However, like all previous versions, the Meteor 4 had a few problems, including needing 450 kilograms of lead ballast in the nose for longitudinal stability. In 1946, over 600 Meteor F4s with Derwent 5 were produced, with many exports as well. In 1949, three years later, a two-seat trainer Meteor 7 was developed from the F4. 
you will see an extended nose which allows for the student pilot in the front and the instructor behind. You can see how the quarter operates there. Now, perhaps the only interesting thing here is you can see where that lead ballast is placed. You can see those two lead blocks there. The final version of the single seat fighter was the Meteor 8. It first flew on 12 October 1948 with Rolls Royce Derwent 8 jet engines. It featured a fuselage stretch of 76 centimetres intended to shift the aircraft's centre of gravity and drastically reduce the need for the nose ballast. Other modifications included an extra fuselage fuel tank, structural strengthening and a Martin Baker ejection seat. By 1950, the RAF fighter squadron started converting from F-4s to f 8 Initially, it was found that when ammunition was expended, the aircraft became tail-heavy and unstable due to the weight of fuel retained in the fuselage tanks no longer being balanced by the ammunition. This was solved by a new tail with taller, straighter edges, giving the later meteorites its distinctive large tail. Over 3,000 meteorites were produced with more than 10 variants, e.g. night fighters and photo reconnaissance and exported to 17 countries, including Australia. In 1950-53, meteorites were used by RAAF Squadron 77 in the Korean War. Initially used in air-to-air -air combat, but not doing too well against the MiGs, it was changed to a more successful role in ground, in ground attack. Small cockpit. You can see, you can see the fuselage fuel tank there and the extra tank, 325 gallons, 95 gallons. And you can also see in this kind of way that the engine is not that big. Uh, this is not very much like modern aircraft instrument panels. You might, it's pretty cramped for one thing. Starting at the left, can you hear me when I'm turning my head? Throttles on the left there. One used to open and close the throttles like this to make it as smooth as possible. A flimsy flap lever, not much more robust undercarriage lever down here. Red lights for undercarriage up and green lights for down. Mac number, indicated airspeed, artificial horizon, vertical speed, engine RPM, Altimeter, compass, slip and turn, engine exhaust temperature. We did uh, a lot of flying in uh, different countries, and of course the Australians always seem to be there. I'll just go back to that one in Malta. In England, of course, the weather was often so bad that you couldn't fly. But that was just an excuse for a champagne party. So, some interesting characteristics of the design and operation of the Gloucester Meteor. Very brief. On takeoff, you had to take care not to get the nose wheel too high while still on the ground because it was easy to hit the tail on the runway. 
Like any aircraft, a stall could initiate a spin. But in a meteor, a spin could sometimes be prefaced by rolling upside down, making recovery quite tricky, especially as both hands were often required to overcome the heavy forces. The Meteor 8 had rocket-powered ejector seats, but the Meteor 7 did not. So the instructions for abandoning the two-seater read, jettison the hook, dive over the inboard edge of the wing, do not drop out from an inverted aircraft, if the aircraft is spinning, dive out on the side away from the axis of spin. <laughs> After the hood has been jettisoned, the remaining hood strut forms a considerable obstruction on the right side of the front cockpit. <laughs> so the front pilot should leave by the port side, if possible. <laughs> if the speed or altitude is allowed to get too low on approach to landing, a surprising amount of power is required to recover and get back on the ideal glide path. This, of course, was especially so on one engine and a large amount of rudder was also needed, becoming even more exaggerated on overshoot. One positive with the Meteor that it probably had the highest rate of climb for its time, getting to 30,000 feet in under six minutes. With air brakes out and the throttle closed, a high rate of descent of over 15,000 per meter was also possible. Flying on one engine was not straightforward. For example, the overshoot procedure for abandoning the landing was different according to which engine was being used. And I won't go into that. The throttle, as I suggested, needed to be open and closed very smoothly to avoid an engine failure. If you went like that or like that with the throttles, the engine would cut out. It made formation flying quite tricky. As mentioned, the stretched fuselage of the Meteor 8 and the Meteor 7 contained an extra fuel tank of 95 gallons in front of the main tank, feeding by gravity into both compartments of the main tank. The main fuel tank of 325 gallons in the fuselage behind the cockpit was divided into two equal compartments, front and rear. The two compartments were connected by a balance clock which was normally closed, but could be manually opened by the pilot. The port engine was fed from the front compartment and the starboard engine from the rear compartment. This caused a few problems with fuel management. For example, in a steep climb, the sloping fuel level in the front compartment could drop below the fuel feed point, starving the port engine while in a steep descent, the starboard engine could die from lack of fuel. <laughs> if flying on one engine, the situation was even more complicated. Again, I won't go into the details, but there were different instructions for whether you were in level flight, in a climb, in a descent, on the port engine or on the starboard engine. Interestingly, at full power on just one engine, the fuel flow was greater than the flow from one compartment to the other through the open balance coil. It's hard to find in any official literature, but it was known that if you selected wheels down with the dive brakes still out, some unpredictable instability and partial lack of control could result. <laughs> It seems that this lack of stability could have been caused by a spiralling airflow around the aircraft being initiated by the wheels coming down one at a time, uh, which it was designed to do, the starboard wheels first and then the port wheels and then the locking. This would normally correct itself when the second leg came down, but could be exacerbated and even made impossible to correct if the dive brakes were out when the undercarriage was selected down. The aircraft would then become unstable in a variety of ways. For example, when this happened to me, the aircraft would no longer turn left. So after lots of trying various manoeuvres, my only recourse 
was to keep carrying out right-hand turns to land. <laughs> Lastly, in a high-speed spiral dive, control loads became extremely heavy, so that much higher forces than expected were required for recovery. Both hands pushing hard on the control column and a powerful push on the rudder was required. Unfortunately, this was never officially recognised, so there continued to be many fatalities related to this. The fatalities were officially labelled unexplained dive into the ground. <laughs> My book opens with my personal experience of this event. Just finishing off with some of the accidents. Can you all read that? So, top of the list happens to be over those years, those 12 years. Top of the list is unexplained dive into the ground with 80 deaths. There were 80 collisions, 50 deaths. Single, single engine practice was always tricky. Bailing out, as we've seen, might not be straightforward, even with the ejector seats. There are a hundred instances of uh, people bailing out. Unfortunately, 30 of them unsuccessful. Lots of write-offs and approach and landing. Many of them because of that idea that if you got below the glide path, it was actually really quite difficult to get back up high, and they often landed a couple of fields short of the runway. And because the endurance of the meteor, without its drop tanks, I and mean, you, you couldn't have drop tanks if you were doing any fighting, um, was just one hour. So our typical flight time was 50 minutes, which just allowed enough time to go around once if you missed the first landing. Probably the worst year was 1952, which was my first full year with 616 Squadron. When three meteors were written off every week and a meteor pilot killed every four days. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Jeffrey. I think we're quite lucky still to have him. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Thank you. John. After those who do this, you care when you split by the Harold, sir. The meteor was faster climbing and in straight level flight. But actually, the Spitfire had a higher critical Mach number than the Meteor. In other words, you could say it was more streamlined because it could fly in a dive up to 0.9 Mach number, uh, whereas the Meteor was limited to 0.82 Mach number, even in a dive. And in a dive, anyway, as we've seen, all your controls locked up anyway. Are you referring to the accidents and deaths, sir? Oh, well, good question. Um, There were probably just nearly as many accidents due to accidents rather than uh, fighting in the war. Uh, the accidents during the war were greater. And that might be one reason why, even though they seem so high now, they weren't quite so high as what it was in the war. The industry thought it was acceptable.
what do you want to be in your next life? <laughs> <laughs> Not a pilot. <laughs> If there are no more questions, I just want to uh, thank my. Oh! No, I'm just going to make it probably safe for the question. I have to work on these aircraft in the early 60s, and I now know why they flew pilotless all the time. <laughs> Very good. Whilst I um, thank Geoffrey and present him with. The usual pen, which 1st of May, it's in a red container. That's rather good, isn't it? So um, when I present the pen, would you all thank Jeffrey for his presentations?